It is my great pleasure to uh, facilitate this opening session with uh, my co-host, Tracy, um, from IED. Uh, my name is Bettina Koehler. I'm with the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center. I am joining you from South Africa. I know some of you are in Glasgow, and so we are, of course, using this opportunity to have the first ever virtual uh, version of Development in Climate Days. Um, it is indeed a special occasion, and so um, I'd like to say a big welcome to all of you. Um, it's an exciting two days. We already had a session, a, par a set of parallel sessions this morning. Um, we are, of course, also navigating, not as usual in Development in Climate Days, where we're navigating a weekend together, um, where we are all physically in the same time zone. This time we are navigating time zones, we are navigating weekday obligations, um, the negotiations, um, some who are joining from home, other obligations. So uh, thank you all for making the time for joining. Development and Climate Days have a very long tradition. Um, for many years, it was traditionally the weekend between week one and week two of the COP. It was, and it still is, a space where we could make sure that civil society voices but also voices of local governments are heard to really ensure that the climate discourse would also very actively engage and look after um, most vulnerable communities engage and would really consider local knowledge, engage and consider and really take to heart local solutions and to really allow learning from um, the grassroots to the global level and to also allow people from the grassroots level and from national society, from um, NGOs, civil society, to really have a good understanding what is happening on the global level at the COP. So with this, I'd like to um, welcome you all. We have come a very long way. The first um, initial impulse to start development and climate days um, many years ago was really to say we need to move the discussion and the discourse from a science discussion that is around greenhouse gas emissions and mainly mitigation to really um, embrace also development issues. We have really um, made great progress. Um, we could hear we could hear in the last um, um, more than a week um, in at COP loss and damage getting a large traction and a lot of attention. Having said this, we also have a long way to go. We have we are facing vast challenges. I think you all heard, and we're going to hear more from our speakers um, in this plenary to um, where we have where we have made some progress in the COP, where we are still um, encountering challenges. And uh, so um, this is up to us to really make a difference. It is up to us to really move things forward. And uh, I'm very pleased uh, to be opening um, Development and Climate Days in this plenary with uh, my colleague Tracy and a host of fantastic speakers. Um, this is the first time that we are gathering virtually um, that brings new opportunities, for example, um, maybe better or broader participation, people being able to join without necessarily um, um, emitting huge amounts of carbon while flying around the globe. Um, hopefully, Development and Climate Days is also more inclusive as more people can join without having a vast travel budget um, or the time to travel um, to Development and Climate Days. But of course, we are also encountering a lot of challenges in this virtual um, version of Development and Climate Days. We have other obligations. Um, people in Glasgow are pulled in many different directions. And of course, we um, are, some of us might be struggling with bandwidth issues. So we hope we can navigate this as, we as I hope we're navigating the adaptation challenge. And that is with flexibility and a sense of humor. So uh, the biggest uh, um, challenge is actually that we don't have coffee breaks and development in climate days, the informal sessions have always been very precious sessions where we could engage, where we could network, make new connections 
and actually really be engaged um, in a way that is new and that is um, refreshing. And while we wish we had a coffee break, all of us together, um, we would like to take this opportunity right now to put you into a breakout room with a person you might have met before or you might have never met before and say three things to whoever you might be encountering in the breakout room. The first one is, can you introduce yourself briefly, your name, where you're from, and then one thing you are really passionate about that you hope we can speak about or tackle in development and climate days today or tomorrow. Make sure it's only, we only have three minutes. So make sure you say this quite briefly. We will bring you back to plenary. Um, like as if you were going for a coffee, you meet some at the buffet, you briefly exchange, you say hello and you come back here to plenary. Thank you for joining this opening plenary of development and climate days. Um, lovely to see you here. I think we're all back here and uh, I hope some of you had a chance to hopefully meet someone who you maybe haven't met before, maybe you made a connection and some of you who are Climate Development Days veterans might recall that um, Salim said at a couple of occasions he has a challenge and that is to speak to at least one or two persons you haven't spoken to before. So I think it's an admirable challenge that is certainly timeless. So uh, let's see if even in the virtual space, you can actually manage in some way or other in a side, in a, in a parallel session and plenary in the um, networking sessions to reach out to at least two persons you have maybe not met before. If you just had an introduction, well, maybe then you're way ahead and uh, on a good path. With this, I'd like to say, um, let's use Development and Climate Days here in the virtual space to engage, to draw on our collective wisdom, and also to bring our emotion and our knowledge to move this conversation forward. We, we don't have much time. We heard that over and over again, also in COP. We know this um, and let's make sure we can actually further this agenda of having effective and just action for the most vulnerable communities. And with this, I hand over to Tracy to guide us through the next segment of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Bettina, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we are really glad to have you here. It feels strange because we're used to our physical DNC days where we're able to hug each other and catch up. But nevertheless, let's make the use the best use of this. So in the next session, we want to link up with what is happening at the COP. We know that most of us are in the civil society or non-state actor space, but we whatever is happening at the COP really concerns us. So uh, introducing myself, I'm Tracy Kajumba. I work as a principal researcher with the International Institute for Environment and Development in the climate change group. And here with us this morning uh, or afternoon elsewhere or evening, we have a panel of uh, a team that has been really engaging with what is going on. And what we've been emphasizing as we plan for DNC days is how we link DNC days messaging with other initiatives and other events that are going on around the COP so that we are not working in isolation. We need collective action to see the change that we need to see. So I want to introduce uh, the, the panel that we have this morning. Uh, we have uh, Gebru Jemba, who is a delegate of the Democratic Republic of Ethiopia in the negotiations. And he has been involved in the negotiations since 2008. So he's really experienced in that. He was elected as chair of the LDC group in the climate change negotiations for two terms beginning in January 2017. He's a meteorologist, so he understands what is happening and he works with the Global Green Institute in Ethiopia. And uh, we also have a second panelist who is uh, Tudor Salazar. He's a youth and he's a children and youth climate advocate from Peru. He's currently an intern at UNICEF, Latin America and the Caribbean region. Very passionate about loss and damage. 
Youth Participation Intergenerational Justice. He's also in Glasgow at the COP following negotiations on loss and damage and adaptation. He also uh, supports a very interesting uh, creation, the Climate Box, which is a tool that supports people to access climate-related information through WhatsApp and Facebook. So we see innovation there. Uh, we have uh, our third panelist, Sylvie Wabi Skandat. She's an agronomist and resilience advisor for the Food and Agriculture Organization Emergency and Resilience Office in Rome. But she's also co-lead of the UNFCC Marrakesh Partnership for Global Climate Action and its Climate Resilience Pathways, uh, together with the Global Resilience Partnership. And both FAO and GRP are co-hosts of the DNC Days 2021. And our last but not least panelist is Dr. Ayinka Granderson. Uh, she's a senior technical officer in uh, climate change adaptation specialist with lots of experience on community adaptation. She has worked on climate change and environment management in the Pacific and Caribbean islands. And she now manages the climate change and disaster risk reduction for Canary. So that's the panel we have this morning. So we are going to have sort of a conversation. Feel free to openly tell us what is happening in your own views, what you've been following and what needs to go on. So I will start with Gebru. Uh, so Gebru, you've been in the negotiations for years and years and you're there now. So what are the key issues of focus at the UNFCC negotiations at the COP26 now? And what does success look like for the least developed countries? We've been hearing lots of issues concerning SAIDs and LDCs. And then uh, it would also be great to know what the LDCs are doing themselves support locally led adaptation and resilience, which is the focus for DNC days. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, dear participants. It's a pleasure to be here with you and this very important event. Uh, as Tracy introduced, I am currently supporting the LDC group focusing on Article 6. Overall, uh, when we gather here, uh, the key expectations from our group were especially on addressing the mitigation gap. When you look at what our, the science is asking us and where we are in terms of aggregate NDC all over the world, we are far below what has been required. So one of the key asks from the uh, LDC group was we need to fill the gap. We have been seeing global leaders last week talking nice things, but we need that talk to be translated into action on the ground. So more ambition, uh, that needs to, we need to see it in their indices, ambition on action and support, that's finance. So uh, this is one of our key asks and what we expect this COP to deliver, increasing ambition both on action and support, filling the gap. And then, of course, to realize the NDC, we need to finalize the rule book. So there are some outstanding issues. As you all know, Article 6 is one of the current issues which we need to address. We have been negotiating it for the last six years after Paris. It's time now. We need to, after, I think the world is uh, watching us. So uh, we have been really emphasizing we need to deliver. And the other issue is on the common time frames on five year versus 10 year cycle. It seems there's some convergence on it. So these are also uh, one of uh, our key asks. Of course, more progress on loss and damage as well, both in terms of the process as well as support for loss and damage. So overall, these are the four kind of key asks what we are expecting uh, from this scope. So, these are our asks and our offer to the overall process is like we have been uh, really li global leaders in terms of really showing by doing, by coming up with an ambitious NDC, negotiating in a good phase to come up with a result. So unfortunately in some of the issues like on article six, we have been meeting like, the whole last week. Uh, instead of women moving from one iteration to the other, like breathing in and out, we don't see significant progress. So 
uh, I do believe that it will this week at the high level session the ministry will start. That's where compromise is to happen. So for us, uh, best outcome would be an outcome which doesn't make everyone happy. Uh, so we are, we are ready to be unhappy because that's what compromise means. So now it's going to be in the hands of our ministers. Our technical experts exhausted their mandates. We are not ready for compromise. So the, uh, on finance, there's some progress, but overall, to assess the progress, we need to wait for the final day. But across, there are some progress, some delays, but this week is more the high level session. And we'll see, uh, we believe we are optimistic as a group to see a more balanced and something which will help our environment rather than helping few countries for short-term benefits. We, we are looking at the long-term impact, uh, which we need to, gen with, to uh, really contribute. So here is where we are in terms of negotiation. So we'll have more updates in due course, of course. Uh, regarding the uh, LDC's engagement on the local led adaptations, as you all know, Life AR, it's a list of country for effective adaptation and resilience, which was uh, launched some three years back, has been uh, have, has already set a vision uh, of net zero by 2050, of course, following uh, a resilience pass by 2030. We put our key offers, what we can do, what we are looking for our partners, because in the in our world, I mean, like it doesn't have pound boundary. Our environment doesn't have boundary like political ones. So unless we all act together, we'll not bring any change. So we put our ask. We we also provide what we can do, setting a vision, doing things in a business unusual way. So if you if you look at what's happening now in terms of resilience building, uh, really it's a, we are, it's keeping us in a vicious circle of uh, maladaptation. Because if you look at the approach, top-down, sector-specific, short-term, uh, there are a number of intermediaries in between. So if you look at the most studies show that not more than 10% of the resources is reaching to the local community. Should we keep this uh, business as usual way of doing this? I don't think so. So for that, what we have been proposing is in a business as usual way of delivering things in a bottom-up approach uh, for committees to own the process across the value chain from planning, implementing, and reporting. That way, if we uh, give them that uh, capacity, then we'll be able to see more impact within a short period of time. So in that regard, LiveAR has been undertaking a number of activities uh, with partners. Recently, the recent update is like, we have a number of partners who signed the compact in Madrid. Uh, this Monday, the last Friday, US and Norway joined the uh, new compact uh, signatories. So we are bringing a number of partners to support us. We developed a 10 year plan, which is to, to be implemented in six front runner countries across Africa and Asia. That piloting, we believe we are not replaced the big financiers. Our aim is to pilot something in a different way so that others will learn out of it. So uh, for sake of time, I'll stop here, but we have lots of progress, which I will, uh, I will not go to the details, but we are progressing well. And countries are choosing, the front runner countries are choosing which channel they are going to follow in piloting. Uh, they're doing the situation analysis. And uh, from next year onwards, we will start the piloting across the six front runner countries. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you very much, Gabriel, for that update, especially what is happening at the COP. Very interesting, and uh, the tensions in there. So we'll see what happens uh, in this week, but thanks for the update for what happened in week one, and also sharing what the LDCs are doing themselves to move towards uh, effective adaptation and resilience. So uh, we will move to our second pan panelist, uh, R2, the youth. Um, uh, Gebra has mentioned loss and damage, and we all know that there's been a lot of conversation on loss and damage, lots of events, not just at the COP, but throughout this year, there has been really momentum on loss and damage. So um, from the side of the youth, I know there are youth groups that have been working on loss and damage activism. So what do you look at as the 
what does it mean for the youth if the decisions at the COP don't really support loss and damage? And what is at stake for you as young people? Tracy, hello. Uh, I, I guess you were referring to me. My uh, connection so, was really bad and then I had to stop, but I guess you oh, were referring to me. But yes. well, thank you very much for uh, everyone uh, for your time. And also thank you very much for the invitation to be part of this panel. So um, the question would be, what is not at stake mm -hmm. in this climate crisis? Mm -hmm. um, well, I want to refer to one of uh, recent studies that uh, UNICEF has released in August, uh, this last August, which is the Children's uh, Climate Risk Index. And in this uh, report or in this index that has been developed by UNICEF, it mentions that um, the climate crisis is a child rights crisis. So uh, what at stake is mainly the rights for children and youth uh, in all these contexts. Unfortunately, um, yes, children and youth have has been tokenized in these last uh, COPs. Well, I'm in COP in the UNFCCC processes since COP20 when it was in Lima in my country. And since then I could see how young people or the participation of uh, young people has been undermined and has, I would even say, misused in the sense of we have been uh, always invited for the pictures. We have been always invited to be, you know, to tick the box saying, okay, we have invited young people, they are included. But at the same time, when we speak out or when we bring up our voices, nothing is reflect, re reflected in the documents. So that's something uh, that we have to uh, put a special focus if we want to talk about inclusiveness. Um, loss and damage is an uh, important topic that has been also historically, from my perspective, uh, left behind from the negotiations. Um, we as, or myself as a um, person from a developing country, I'm from Peru, and also I want to bring the voices from my, my fellows from the small island develop, developing states um, who are the most um, affected in all these, let's say, negotiations and climate game, I, I call it even sometimes, because it seems that people in the negotiations are just playing who has more power than others. Um, so in, in, in this sense, loss and damage, I think, should have more focus from, from our um, climate leaders. And also I would like to stress the point that the finance in this sector is key to, to solve or to, to, to carry out projects that can reduce uh, the risks for, for many communities. Um, I, I hear that Scotland has uh, committed to provide some finance in this regard, but I think so far the unique country that is open to that um, but we see other nations that have, I mean, more economic power uh, that are the main, uh, I mean, the main producers of CO2 and other greenhouse gases uh, that are not um, taking part of, of these um, negotiations or, or are not taking part of this uh, discussion on financing uh, the loss and damage or even talking about the agenda, they are just delaying and some other countries simply bring other topics on the table and, you know, it's it's not fair at all. And from the youth, young perspective, uh, I would say that it's sad, it's sad that um, we are not being represented in these uh, negotiations. Um, myself, I luckily had the badge from a party overflow so I can access to the negotiations. But as such, as a young representative, I mean, I'm sort of illegally going uh, and bring uh, the, the, the youth perspective, but there is no uh, young representatives from the countries. From my experience in this COP, I have seen um, only, I would say from the total amount of countries that are here, um, 98% or 95% of the countries don't have a young representative. Um, and if they are young representatives from those countries are young people that are looking by themselves 
the uh, uh, ways to come here, even though it's a very expensive country and it's very difficult to access. So I think we have to acknowledge that from many young leaders from around the globe that are coming here to bring their voices. Um, yeah, and I'm also glad that we, in these last years, the young perspective has been uh, been positioned in, in, in the negotiations, um, but still still needs to, to, to be uh, meaningfully included. And I'm also glad that academia is also paying attention to loss and damage, the private sector as well, even though many are using this as we have here, for sure, this greenwashing thing that is going around the negotiations or the, the, the COP26. And yeah, so just keep in mind what is not at stake if yep. we don't discuss uh, loss and damage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Atul, for that reflection, but uh, very touching that we see exclusion of youth voices. And, uh, you know, the, they are not in the spaces where they should be, and, and children and other groups. So uh, let's continue with that struggle. Uh, we don't know what will come out in the second week, but uh, let's watch the space. Uh, we'll move to our next panelist, Sylvie. Uh, who is going to talk about the Marrakesh Partnership for Global Climate Action. So Marrakesh Partnership is supposed to really enhance the implementation of the Paris Agreement with high level champions. It should also be sort of leading us to direction for action. So Sylvie, what do you see as the connection with the Marrakesh Partnership for Global Climate Action and what we are trying to achieve at DNC days? Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Hello to everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Um, and I'm really, it's my pleasure to be with all of you and to speak quickly to those important linkages. Uh, this is important because in um, I had really the chance to belong both in this Marrakesh partnership process and the development climate days. I'm not the old timer in the development climate days, but I think there's enough, a few years is enough to, to learn and share a bit where we stand uh, today. I don't know how many of you knows about the uh, Marrakesh partnership, but the development in climate days was is nearly 20 years old. It was started in 2002, and it was really an idea to bring the voices of the communities and non-state actors um, along the process of COP. The Marrakesh Partnership is a very similar in, in uh, terms of, of objectives, but the timing is different. It was only launched in 2017 by the high-level climate champions, Morocco and, and France. And it was the idea to give a more official space and platform to the sort of uh, so-called non-state actors. It's served by the UNFCCC Secretariat, and it's a sort of a, a, a official platform for the non-state actors and, and led by the high-level climate champion. The event took place here yesterday, and in terms of content, we really have a lot of similarities because both the Marrakesh Partnership and especially its Climate Resilience Pathway and the DNC days focus on climate resilience, climate resilience across and within sectors, promoting climate risk management implemented by humanitarian climate and development actors. It really focuses on practical climate action, really concrete examples coming from people working on the field. It puts emphasis on the frontliners advocating for the action for people and nature first. And this is also at the core of what the climate champions have launched last year, which is the Race to Resilience campaign. It, both the NCDs and Marrakesh Partnership have similar themes. The Marrakesh Partnership has seven sectoral themes, which are land use, ocean, water, energy, transport, human settlement and industry, and two cross-cutting themes. One is resilience and one is finance. And here I'm speaking to you as a co-leader um, on the climate resilience, because we're trying in the Marrakesh partnership to, to pass, 
to promote a pathway, a vision for joined up action and climate resilience for the people, putting nature and the needs of people at the center. The DNC days, at least in the last, last two sessions of COP25 today, we have similar themes. Climate resilience um, is really put in the five themes which are most secure, which are cities, agri-food system, and finance. So there's a similarity in the themes. But there's also similarities in terms of the climate risk management tools which are promoted. Nature-based solution and early warning, early action or forecast-based financing are among the suite of the nine climate risk management actions, which are part of the climate resilience pathway. Maybe I'm going a bit fast, but this is really the, in essence, the, the content is very similar. Now on the process and constituency, we have many actors and partners which are similar. They are the same in, in both these processes in the Mahakesh Partnership Resilience Pathway that was you know, showcasing action yesterday and also in what we are going to discuss today. I already had some talk this morning. Both events bring the voice, aims really to bring the voices from communities and people really on the front line and those that are not heard enough during the COP processes. And so um, this year, hopefully with the virtual event of the DNC days, we can even give more voices to people on the front line. I would like to conclude that, and, and really thank you for allowing me to bring these two processes together and the Global Resilience Partnership being also a co-leader of this climate resilience pathway of the Mahakesh Partnership. I would really like to, to, to conclude that these processes are very much linked on the urgency and solidarity, as it was mentioned by, by previous speakers, the solidarity to, to tackle the climate crisis. We cannot wait and we must all act now, humanitarian development, climate finance, business and peace building actors. But we need to have this shared language to shape and share a, a resilience, climate resilience narrative around this key suite of climate risk management actions or tools. That is our common way forward. In an emergency, we can no longer face the fragmentation that we have today. We need to understand one another and act together. And I think really these two processes are trying to aim at this. Thank you very much. And we can do this today and we can better share our action and narrative together for building climate resilient societies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvie. Um, for your interventions and indeed really we need coherence, we need solidarity and that takes us to the next and last speaker uh, on locally led adaptation. Uh, there has been for the last two years a lot of work on uh, locally led adaptation. IID working with WRI and other partners came up with principles of locally led adaptation and the background to that really was around uh, all the disjointed interventions, uh, finance not being accessed, not being flexible, the same issues that we are discussing. And we've seen uh, governments and donors joining in. We had FCD and Ireland, but uh, at the COP this time, there has been a lot of work on LLA, a lot of sessions. We've seen Danida, CEDA, USAID and the Dutch Foreign Affairs joining into the partnership, we have over 70 organizations signed up. But then we also recognize there are so many other interventions across the board working on climate and resilience. So uh, Dr. Anka, how can learning, sharing and advocacy spaces like DNC days and all those others contribute to locally led adaptation and building on Sylvie's point, working together in solidarity, having the same messaging? Thank you, Tracy. Um, firstly, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, it's really lovely to be able to join you virtually from the beautiful Isles of Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean for this panel. Um, so thanks for the question, which is an interesting one. 
Um, I think sharing knowledge and experiences is really critical for us to learn and really get a sense of what is working and what isn't. And to identify good practices and innovations in locally led adaptation that can be scaled up and out. You know, when we're hard at work focused on our specific projects, we tend to think about things very narrowly in, in our silos and not to have the headspace to problem solve creatively. And it's really out of the dialogue, out of these kind of informal spaces like the DMC days, that some of the most creative ideas are born and fleshed out with people from different perspectives, practitioners, policymakers, activists, and academics you know, coming together. And so we really, the DNC days um, at COP this year will be an extension of that global community of practice for locally led adaptation that currently exists for all those that have endorsed the principles and really trying to sort of solidify and unify around what needs to be done to translate the principles into action. Um, and my organization, the Caribbean Natural Resources Institute, Canary, has really thoroughly enjoyed being part of that practice which has been very ably co-led by the team at IID and WRI. And then over the course of 2021, you know, there's been a lot of shared learning as part of that community um, in terms of mapping, I think over a hundred examples of locally led adaptations um, that are being delivered with non-state as well as state actors and running a series of dialogues you know, across Africa, Asia Pacific, Latin America and the Caribbean to really understand you know, what makes these efforts business unusual, what have been the challenges, and to really highlight some of the good practices and the innovative models of finance and governance, which we really want to try and scale up and replicate. And I think DNT days will provide a really invaluable space to further these dialogues about how we can translate the principles into action and get money where it matters to really meet the needs of those on the front line. I think, of course, there's also a fantastic opportunity to really join together and amplify the voices of the most vulnerable or often missing in these spaces at COP, from the SIDS and from the LDCs to advocate for the outcomes that we want to see. The side events are really the most interesting part of COP, but COP is about the negotiations in the end, and we need to see ambitious and accelerated action not just more blah, 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 as Mitzi Tan, Greta Thunberg, and all the young activists have been putting it so plainly at Saturday's marches in Glasgow and in other spaces. We really want to see some very concrete action. And you know, as a regional NGO, we work very closely with small state fisher folk across the Caribbean, for example. And then when I go out to work with them, I often get some version of it's really tough, you know, we have to go further, we spend more money on gas, there's less fish, you know, there's all this sargassum and seaweed that's blocking up the beaches and our engines. And the women that sell and clean the fish, you know, complain that there's not enough fish that people want to buy. And it's so hot in the market, they have to spend more time getting ice and the fish spoils more quickly. And these are the people on the front line that we need to help, that we need to advocate for. And they're very interested in climate smart and more sustainable practices that can both add value and make their enterprises more resilient. But you know, co-developing a sustained program of work with these fisher folk requires long-term flexible financing, which is not readily available. And a recognition that you know, adaptation, for example, in the fisheries context, looks a lot like good development. And this should not reduce the fundability because it's not purely about reducing climate risks. And so I think that's another key thing that I wanted to point out. And so there have been some very exciting pledges made over the last week at COP in terms of scaling up finance dedicated for locally led adaptation. I think, as you just mentioned, there are over 70 organizations that have now endorsed the principles. Um, and there are a number of key multilaterals and bilateral funders that have come on board with a few pledges coming from Denmark, Sweden, US, UK, just yesterday, um, and a really fantastic kind of session that was led by IID and WRI. And in aligning this work with the principles to ensure that we're improving the quality and effectiveness 
of this financing so that we're delivering it in ways that are tailored to the needs of those on the front lines and empowering these actors to really design and implement adaptation actions for fair and just outcomes. So we really want to see the endorsements and pledges continue and to translate into concrete programs. And so, I mean, I think that's it for me. <laughs> in terms Thank of what you. I'm yeah. Thank you so much, I think, uh, bringing these issues to light. It's not about talking. We need to see action happening at the local level. Thank you so much to the panelists for all this very informative conversation. I would like to hand back to Bettina now for the next session. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I must say, I see in the chat happening what sometimes happen as DNC days, and it really delights me. So thank you for all to engaging in the chat, asking if someone works on climate and health because uh, we have someone writing a PhD on it and responding to it. This is really amazing. You're bringing the spirit of DNC days into this virtual space. So thank you all for this. Um, I really was inspired by um, the speakers. I also really resonated with the voice of Arturo. Thank you so much, Arturo, for putting us a bit on the spot and saying, so how serious are we about, you know, not just listening to youth voices, but also really including this in the key messaging, this taking it forward for this to really be embraced and not just uh, permitted <laughs> to um, be heard um, actually in action that we move forward. A challenge to all of us, uh, well noted Arturo, and thank you so much for uh, shaking us up a little bit. I think it's what we need. Uh, we heard earlier DNC days has been traditionally always a space for doing things a little differently. Some of you might uh, recall a cooking session where uh, Pablo and the chef from Dakar managed to cook some uh, insects that some of us thought were delicious and some of us thought were, were a bit more challenging. And uh, it is this spirit um, that, of course, is harder to create in this virtual space. But nevertheless, we would like to offer you a couple of uh, uh, cartoons that we'd like to share with you now. And this is for you time to take action. Let me see if you can hopefully see this screen here. So we worked a lot with humor. We worked a lot with humor and we said, how can we bring candor and creativity to these complex discussions? Sometimes they're stuck. Sometimes we know there is an elephant in the room and no one talks about it. So what can we do about this? How can we actually make this situation unstuck by imagining new ways of doing it? So we know that the current systems are failing us. How can we actually really imagine better futures and a new way of doing this? And uh, what we did is we um, did um, a couple of cartoonathons in the last um, um, nearly two years on a lot of different um, 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 events, most of them virtual, nearly all of them virtual events, where actually cartoon artists were listening to our conversations and then putting together cartoons that sometimes were painfully putting the finger where it really hurt. I think it makes us laugh, but it also makes us realize that actually some of the truth is something we need to face. We can laugh about it and then we need to take action. This was an event that took place yesterday um, at, the, at Glasgow. It was a presidency event around exploring loss and damage facilitated by Martin van Alst from the Climate Center with Alex Sharma there, the president of the um, COP and uh, Mia Motley, prime minister from Barbados. And it was amazing to um, see how people engaged with cartoons to really tackle some of the loss and damage discussions in a different way. So um, really good to see also that people not happening often in Glasgow were speaking to each other about cartoons and exchanging ideas despite uh, COVID regulations, of course, of social distancing, but also breaking a little bit with the routine that everyone sits in their chair and only, spe um, only um, is by them, him or herself. We have a cartoon wall. Um, demonstrating, um, showing, showcasing about 60 of these cartoons. If you feel these cartoons are useful for your work, also please feel free to reach out to us. 
there are used, um, you can use them free of charge if they're for nonprofit purposes. So um, please um, feel free to do this going forward. And sometimes cartoons can help us to laugh about ourselves and to unlock a little bit the situation that we find ourselves in, because ultimately we're not just thinking about election cycles, we're thinking about the long-term future. I think Arturo was talking about the younger generations, and I would like to say we can also extend this to future generations. So what is it that we need to do that future generations will consider us having been good ancestors? I think is a key question. And for this, we need to be creative. But for this, we also need to see clearly where things are actually profoundly wrong right now and what we can do about this. So um, here is your time to take action. And we have a cartoon gallery that is open. Um, David saw the cartoon gallery in the blue zone. I'm glad you uh, enjoyed it. Um, if you are in Glasgow, feel free. And if you are in Glasgow, you can see if you can track down someone from um, either the British Red Cross or Martin to see if you can have a cartoon postcard that will only reveal the cartoon if you place your hand on it because it has thermoactive paint. Very cool. But for those of you who are here, please go to the cartoon gallery. You can use this tinyurl.com forward slash DC Days 2021. Um, we can also maybe put this in the chat, um, or it's already in the chat, if you can click it, otherwise type it, enter your name um, here um, with, the, with the yellow arrows, or remain anonymous, we don't mind, and have a look at the cartoons, enjoy them, they were all created out of events that happened in the last nearly two years, Leave your comment here and hit submit and wait a moment. Don't hit submit like 10 times because the system will collapse. Um, a bit of patience, take a deep breath um, and uh, look at all the cartoons. And please be generous. We just have a couple of minutes. We just take about three or four minutes to share some of your thoughts of these cartoons. What resonates with you? What infuriates you? What do you think can we do about this? Are there certain cartoons that speak to you? Thank you. Please uh, submit your last comment if you uh, can. And uh, we will uh, have a look at some of the comments here in, in, uh, on the shared screen. Um, please hit submit if you haven't done this yet. And uh, let me open the floor and ask anyone, how was it? Uh, to uh, respond to these cartoons, let's take just a minute to hear a couple of reflections from the, from the floor. Um, if you have uh, the opportunity to speak, great. If we can invite you to just um, share your microphone, open your microphone and share. How was it for you to look at these cartoons? Was it useful? Was there something that particularly resonated with you? Um, Let's hear if there are any things you'd like to share. Great. So uh, we see some comments here. This one has resonated, especially, I think, uh, with many. It got a lot of uh, comments. Someone even sees this reflecting loss and damage. The world, and especially wealthy countries, should be spending this money now by using it well, or we'll be very sorry. Yes, some uh, great thoughts. This one is from a South African cartoon artist, Mangena. Um, and uh, the comments here are speaking to the key issue of flooding that is largely driven by poor planning and development, lack of timely action, focusing on minor issues because they seem more manageable. Interesting comments here, tackling the underlying causes instead of symptoms. Um, this one about the word cloud and uh, how that links to climate and weather um, is uh, linking very nicely to the blah, blah, blah theme that we heard earlier. And also in, of course, uh, um, in, in, of course, the deliberations at COP. Um, 
this one, a very hard hitting one. This is actually by a US cartoon artist, Pat Burns, who also um, draws cartoons for The New Yorker. And this actually uh, emerged as a cartoon from the discussions with negotiators ahead of the COP. So uh, very interesting and of course, uh, quite hard hitting, um, a little uncomfortable nearly. Let me open the floor before we move on to the next one, looking at the themes. We'll leave the gallery open. Please feel free to um, add more comments. And we will then of course share this also with the, um, with the proceedings of DNC days. No comments. It's much harder to put anyone on the spot in the virtual space, I see. No problem. Um, with this, let me stop sharing my screen. And uh, let's move on to the last big segment of this opening plenary, a good way for us to have a good orientation about the themes of these this year's Development and Climate Days. We have five themes um, and we would like to give each of the theme leads the opportunity to briefly introduce the session, uh, the theme, what the theme is all about, and what we can expect. Um, I want to say a huge thanks to all the theme leads that have done a huge amount of work to um, putting these sessions together. They also, have, they also are going to do uh, uh, some work to really pull out the, the key messages. And so we already thank you um, very much for the work you have done and the work that you are still going to do. Um, and with this, I'll hand over first uh, to theme one, building resilient agriculture and food systems. And um, I'll give the floor to Sylvie. Sylvie, the floor is yours. And uh, Roman, I think you were um, asked to share uh, the slide from Sylvie. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with all of you um, and, and to speak to you on the important themes of the agri-food system. Um, we had the chance to be sort of a co-facilitator again with the Global Resilience Partnership for this theme. And we're very happy that the DNC days are putting that theme regularly through their, their favorite theme topics. So it's like many years now that we had the chance to have the Development and Climate Days focusing on the agri-food sectors, or it could be smallholders where there's more livelihood agriculture-based production, but it's the main theme of our discussion. I would like to take you through just a few key points before introducing the, the, the four sessions that you have the chance to participate in. We already had the finance sessions this morning, which was very interesting. I would like to quickly put a, a pitch on the, the importance of that theme. First of all, we, we're really honored to have this theme and put forward also because uh, Professor Salim Hook is the founder of the Development and Climate uh, Days has been also the co-leader at the UN Food System Summit that just concluded last September, um, putting really forward the need for transforming our agri-food system. And Sally Nook has been the co-leader on the resilience action area. This is again to put the emphasis on the convergence and the, the urgency of addressing the agri-food system altogether. Food touches our everyday life, in whether it's from production processing and it's consumption. I myself, trying to produce my fresh food for my family. I'm a little farmer locally, subsistence farmers here in the north, of, in the central of Italy. And it's not easy. So I'm trying to walk the talk. We know that today the, the agri-food system is in its extractive um, uh, practices is generating multiple risks creating many crises. We already have food crisis situations, which are not just, you know, cause of, 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 of uh, crisis and the way we do agriculture, but also impacted by conflict and climate altogether with other socioeconomic shocks. And we know that the agri-food systems are generating more than 30% of the greenhouse gas emissions. 
And we also know that is contributing to a, a very large amount of deforestation, land degradation, over withdrawal of fresh water and so on. This is no longer tenable. So we are trying in this theme to put forward the agri-food system and its transformation as a solution, not so much as a problem. Putting action of, of um, you, many of your participants on the ground, in the field, putting action forward, sharing the good practices that you do in terms of climate risk management, both on the mitigation, but adaptation and resilience side. Transformation is really anchored in three main pillars, inclusion, low carbon and resilience across all these agri-food sectors. And when we talk about the system approach, it's from production processing to consumption. We're trying to address the agri-food system transformation as the benefit of not only tackling the climate crisis, but also the biodiversity crisis, the pandemics and the pollution crisis. Also the food crisis, which is quite important with the rise of hunger we have today. So with, with this, um, we like to really encourage you to join us, as you can see in these four sessions that we have today, which we welcome a very large range and type of speakers from many parts of the world and many types of practices on, on these action in terms of finance for transformation, in terms of Fragility, the, 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 con the colliding shock between conflict and crime and climate in this fragile situation, fragile countries. The way that nature-based, nature-positive solution can be really a very important way forward for tackling climate um, and, and uh, biodiversity crisis, but also livelihood situation and hunger. And then finally, with the more complex, a set of, of, um, of solution, which is addressing the governance, the governments of managing climate risk and how is this being taking place for the food system, advocating for the role of, of open inclusive dialogues and so also linked to the NDC. With this, I look forward to meet all of you in these um, agri-food sessions and thanking you, thanking my colleagues for really helping to put this forward to everyone. A big thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Sylvie. Fantastic. They look like great sessions. Thank you for sharing uh, this with us. And let me introduce now team number two, early warning, early action to leave no one behind. And I'm reaching our theme lead here, Dorothy Heinrich from the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center. Dorothy, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, yeah, my name is Dorothy. I'm a um, technical advisor at the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center. And I was team lead on early warning, early action um, to leave no one behind at the DNC days. So I want to start you just off with basic premise. We're, the idea of finding ways to predict, forecast, track, monitor the impending arrival of an extreme weather event is not something that's new. It's something that people have been doing as long as recorded history and probably beyond. And the idea is that we use information and our understanding of risk to create messages in a variety of different forms to then warn us about the onset of extreme weather. And sometimes if we're lucky of its predicted potential impact. Uh, the idea is then the people, communities, organizations, governments, a range of everyone uh, takes action based on this warning with the aim to minimize the impact that the extreme weather event's gonna have. It's the premise that we, while we may not be able to stop a natural hazard from happening, we can certainly stop it becoming a natural disaster. Oh, sorry, a humanitarian disaster. So this concept linking kind of the early warning to the early action is this catch-all phrase that links everything in that chain from the forecast uh, to the monitoring of a hazard to the creation, dissemination of the warning, and then to all actions taken based on that warning. So this concept, as like science has gotten better, as the humanitarian development sectors have gotten more nimble, as academia has progressed, as uh, governments have been 
um, yeah, and emphasizing this more. The concept is more and more present in all of these discussions. And we've seen it uh, in recent events, we've seen it a lot at COP, uh, and we see it in the way that we're shifting kind of our emphasis in disaster risk reduction from simply responding to disasters to this more anticipatory approach. Uh, the idea of anticipating hazards and acting in advance of them happening. And we're as we're developing this and as we're working on this, um, we're finding more and more about the value of this um, mindset change. And we're also confronted with a lot of questions, um, which leads us now to the question, well, how do we make early warning, early action the best that it can be? How do we use this tool that's at our disposal to really minimize the impacts of disasters uh, in all forms, in the ways that, um, that we want, depending on our, uh, our different focus, then to protect the communities that are most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and extreme weather. So that's kind of the premise that we had when we brought uh, forth this, this topic um, and when we started developing the sessions for the early warning action, early action team theme. And the idea of the track is to kind of examine the most pressing questions that are faced today by all the actors in that early warning, early action spectrum. Um, and so we have four sessions under the track, which you see here. The first one we had this morning, um, called Unprecedented, Widespread, and Rapid uh, with our colleagues at Zephram, um, looking at how are we accounting for climate change and for changing risks uh, in early warning, early action? How can we do this better? How are we doing this already? And how does early warning, early action help us be more resilient to uh, changes of climate risks? The second session, which is the one happening very soon, is um, on the principle of leave no one behind and equity for early warning, early action. It's this fundamental humanitarian principle of something that we're striving um, every day, but we're falling short sometimes. We're not always managing to leave no one behind. There are still a tremendous amount of equity questions um, during disasters. And so this session is really trying to push the conversation to a thoughtful discussion about why is this still happening? What tools can we find? How as a community of DNC days can we come together and find solutions to, um, to really protect the most vulnerable? Um, so yeah, obviously everyone is very welcome to join that in a couple hours, one hour, um, which would be, it'll be very fun and hopefully quite interactive as well. The third session is um, all about, actually day two is all about scaling up anticipatory action. We're talking about early warning, early action more and more. We're discussing how on earth do we manage to make this at scale. And so this is day two of DNC Day, so tomorrow. Um, first session is kind of from the ground up, looking at locally led anticipatory action and how do we bolster these systems and how do we come together as a community to um, work more closely on this localization agenda from the early warning, early action lens. And then the final session is a session all about scaling up at different facets, bringing together the humanitarian climate development et cetera, <laughs> sectors, um, to really discuss if we want to scale up, what do we need to do? What are these ingredients? And, uh, and how are we going to achieve this? Kind of leaving us on a high note at DNC days. Um, so those are the four sessions. I think going through them is a lens of really trying to put lived experiences and local uh, knowledge and understanding at the center of the way that we're talking about this. It's, um, they're quite challenging sections. It's a lot of information to pack into four sessions. Um, and we're trying to make this as interactive as possible. So super invited everyone here to join, um, participate, ask questions, uh, reach out to anybody that you meet at these sessions and uh, hopefully we'll bring this uh, conversation forward. And we'll be able to say the next DNC days that we're building off of, uh, of the ones from this year. So welcome Fantastic. everyone and thank you so much. Thank you, Dorothy, much appreciated. A couple of great sessions there. I hope you managed to make your picks, but there is more on offer. And let me give the floor to the theme lead of theme three, Financing a Resilient Future, led by Paul Steele from IED. Paul, the floor is yours to give a brief introduction of your theme. Um, thanks very much, everybody. Um, I'll keep it uh, relatively short because I know we're, we're a bit tight on time. So uh, as we all know, um, it's all about people. But unfortunately, at the same time, money makes the world go around although maybe I would say that being an economist. Anyway, the sessions we have are focusing on the role of public and private investment, uh, primarily in climate resilience. And we actually already started off, some of you may have heard the, uh, the session this morning on the uh, 
locally led adaptation principles that were mentioned already by several speakers and the link to humanitarian conflict financing, which is a hugely important area given the overlap between those uh, conflict and climate that's emerging. We then secondly have a session on uh, debt, looking at uh, the, uh, the massive debt crisis hitting many developing countries, what we've been calling the triple crisis of debt, climate and nature, and how debt instruments uh, can be used uh, to create an opportunity to link positively with climate and nature. And uh, we'll actually be bringing in some of the international financial institutions. We have the UN and the World Bank on the panel, as well as a number of governments. But we particularly welcome uh, the audience uh, from the uh, um, C DNC days, who we know are traditionally more from the grassroots communities, because we see their roles as twofold. First of all, uh, selecting the key performance indicators on climate and nature, which will feed into the debt instruments. And secondly, uh, monitoring and verifying to make sure that governments are being held account to achieve these uh, key performance indicators and actually make sure the debt financing is used for uh, climate resilience, in some cases mitigation, and also improving uh, nature. So that's the debt session, which will be starting in, um, in at uh, 2.30 uh, GMT time this afternoon. Then we have a very exciting session, two sessions tomorrow, also on finance, one in the morning, that's starting at 8.30 GMT time, led by the Collaborative Africa Budget Reform Initiative, which is a, a, a global uh, South uh, institution made up of um, governments uh, of ministries of finance in Africa. And, but they'll be bringing in uh, finance perspectives from across the world, looking at how to achieve what we call double mainstreaming. How can you mainstream both climate change and gender into your budget processes. And this is a hugely interesting emerging area of work, which uh, a number of governments are starting to tackle. And again, we see a role for civil society to bring their experience of climate change and gender into these uh, government processes. So as I say, that's at 8.30 uh, tomorrow morning, GMT time. And then the final finance session is looking at private finance uh, tomorrow afternoon. That's um, looking at the role of small scale farmers and how their uh, uh, inputs can be capitalized and supported by uh, uh, investors um, so that their uh, inputs can be upscaled and financed to scale. And that will be at uh, tomorrow afternoon. So we hope you'll be able to join at least one or ideally all of those sessions. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. <clears throat> and I love to hear from an economist. Uh, it's all about people. That's really brilliant. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, great sessions there. There are two more themes to choose from. So um, I'm afraid the choice is gonna be even harder. The next theme is uh, financing a resilient future. Um, oops, we just had that one. The second last theme, theme number four, and I see David is already smiling. David Dodman is the lead from IED. And the theme is establishing resilient cities and infrastructure. Cities, of course, hugely important. David, give us an introduction to the theme and the sessions, please. Thanks and hello everyone. As always, it's a great pleasure to be involved in Development and Climate Days. I'm a, a long timer. I think 2008 was the first um, year that I was involved in them. And I really feel it continues to be a, a unique space being both inside the COP, but also outside it, um, deeply engaged, but at the same time, really fundamentally challenging the status quo in the way we're responding to climate change. So I'm speaking about the urban theme, the um, resilient cities and settlements, and our hopes for this. And I'm speaking on behalf of Aditya Bahadur, my IED colleague, um, and all of the session organizers who put together really a, a stellar set of um, sessions on the theme. The cities that people will inhabit in 20 and 30 and 50 years time are being built right now. And the urban jobs that will drive future economies are being created right now. 
Um, and both the built environment and the livelihoods are being created by the people who live in and who are moving to towns and cities. And that's going to be another 2.5 billion people living in urban areas by 2050, and up to 90% of these being in Asia and Africa. So that's why I think um, establishing resilient cities and infrastructure is such an important theme for development and climate days. We've got a great set of organizations and some really fantastic examples of how cities can be made more resilient, particularly for low income and vulnerable groups. So the sessions will include looking at the particular challenges posed by heat. Um, cities will experience temperature rises that are even greater than the global average. We'll be exploring how different urban stakeholders, including grassroots organizations and local government, can work together more effectively um, to reduce risk and build resilience. And taken together, these sessions will help us to come up with ideas and actions that can enable climate change responses that contribute to more equitable and inclusive cities. Do join us for some of those sessions. Fantastic. Thank you, David. <clears throat> I think it's really uh, amazing how we touch on really a lot of the a lot of the issues that are at the moment um, super important. And one, of course, that is also super important, and that is theme number five, is uh, working with nature to build resilience. And uh, with this, I'd like to hand over the floor to um, my colleague from IFRC, Nini Ikalaniman. Nini, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Bettina, and thank you, everyone. Um, and it's a great pleasure to, I'm really excited to hear about all the events that are happening and really development and climate days, like David was mentioning. I haven't been involved quite as long, but I do remember already a decade ago being involved, and it really is such a unique um, event, and it's great to see that we're able to keep that momentum going, even where, if we're online this year. So on the theme five of working with nature to build resilience, so this is a theme that we're co-leading with IFRC and IIED, um, and I think it's extremely topical this year. I mean, um, in some, some have been calling this the nature cop. Um, and that's not because it's on the official agenda this year. Um, it's included in the Paris Agreement. So in a sense, nature is embedded in the broader discussions on adaptation, uh, on mitigation and targets around that. Um, it's included in, in the finance discussions, of course, critically as one of the sub themes. Um, and it's, it's really part of that, but the theme nature has on the sides, on the, under the COP presidency had a huge prominence. Um, we've had the president of the United States talking about the role of restoring ecosystems um, as a means to reduce vulnerability of communities. Um, we've had heads of states from everywhere, from Costa Rica, Seychelles, Sweden, um, really across the continents talking about the importance of nature, both for adaptation and mitigation. And I think that really shows that this is not an issue that's on the sidelines. This is really critical for us to be able to reduce uh, the impacts of climate change and support the most vulnerable. Um, and it's really in that context that we want to be also understanding that the agendas of climate change, of biodiversity loss, of disaster risk reduction, of land degradation, these are all interlinked and the solutions we need to find uh, need to come together. We've had declarations during this COP about additional fin uh, financing for deforestation, uh, for halting deforestation by 2030. Um, we've had commitments around sustainable agriculture, again, um, not in the official negotiations, but on the margins. So there's a lot of political momentum, there's financial commitments, but what does this mean in practice? What does that mean for us as practitioners? And then more importantly, what does that mean for vulnerable communities? And that's really where we want to tap into uh, under theme five and like dig a bit deeper and understand what that means. Um, and actually, I also had a slide like Sylvie that I was going to show. So we're basically we're going through two broad themes. And so one is looking more um, at the role of nature in building resilience, specifically in farm and forest landscapes. That's a theme that IIED is lean, leading. There was a session already really this morning looking at case studies from the front line um, on what does NBS look like in practice? How can it deliver development and climate uh, benefits? And then tomorrow afternoon, um, they're going to dig a bit further into looking at the role of smallholders um, and local groups and how they manage their farms and forests in a way that builds their resilience with nature. Um, and then from the uh, IFRC side, we're going to be more looking at how, um, when we talk about 
climate change, we're not just looking in the future. This is happening now. What are the climate related disasters that we are addressing that the most vulnerable people are already facing today? Um, and so this afternoon, we're going to be looking at um, what are the opportunities and challenges of using green and grey infrastructure to increase flood resilience. We're going to have community voices. We're going to have private sector and, and environmental and development organizations speaking about that. And tomorrow, we're going to be looking specifically at drought and seeing that when we look at the interlinkages of climate change, drought and displacement, is there a role for nature to play in that um, and in providing some type of solution? And if so, what that is. And again, we're going to have humanitarian environmental organizations. We're going to have a UN convention to combat desertification um, and a community voices from Kenya. Red Cross. So really encouraging you to join us um, and see how do we bridge this momentum for nature um, from this COP into looking at how that can be turned into action on the ground to increase resilience of the most vulnerable today and in the future. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Nini. What a choice of uh, sessions. Um, please be reminded that you can, of course, um, put together your own session schedule by um, just uh, clicking on the um, add to my calendar button or uh, joining the session when it is time to join the session. A special thanks to all the theme leads and everyone having hosted already or hosting a session today and tomorrow. We're really looking forward to digging deeper and uh, I love the idea of digging deeper when it comes to uh, working with nature. Of course, it's not just what's on top of the off the crust, but also what is uh, underneath in the soil. So we hope we can all dig there. We can make these connections. We hope you can be actively reaching out, networking, despite us not being able to hug, as Tracy said so eloquently at the beginning. And with this, I hand over back to you, Tracy, to leave us with a couple of thoughts for inspiration to take us through these DNC days. Over to you, Tracy. To everyone, um, all our speakers at the beginning, the panel, and the theme leads for all the work that you've put into this. But uh, quickly, in the interest of time, the summary that comes out of this for me is that global inequality and inclusivity issues continue to rise, not only here, but even at the COP that was coming through uh, a lot. Uh, groups that are likely to be excluded, the exclusion of voices of the youth, children, women, indigenous groups, and others, are things that as B and C days need to be aware of and take forward. Uh, a lot has been coming out on tokenism, which as Tudor mentioned at the beginning, and they've had it come through even at the COP, of saying we need a youth or we need a woman to be on the group, but are we really listening to the voices from the ground as we talk about locally led adaptation? And we also note that there's a lot going on, lots of initiatives other than DNC days. So we need a common stand. We need common messaging across different initiatives for us to be listened to, for us to be able to influence. Uh, we need to think local, but act global. If we really want to promote principles of local related adaptation, because if we keep thinking from this side of, of in the North, we are working in the South, we are not thinking about what people contribute at community level, their knowledge, their capabilities, their experiences, we shall continue missing the point. The issue of ambition for developed countries definitely is a key point, especially for this COP, but also as even civil societies advocate for financing, for adaptation, for loss, of loss and damage, that still continues to be a key focus. And working in business and usual ways, as Alia mentioned, is really, really critical to move on from what we've been doing that may not be working. When you look at the DNC days themes, they are taking us back to where we should be working and focusing on real issues in the cities, looking at nature-based solutions, early warning, food and agriculture, but also with the component of financing to be able to do that. So as DNC days, so the question I want to leave with you, we, DNC days have been around for like 20 years now. So how do we promote the voices of those that are not heard, bringing the stories and evidence from local to global level? And how do we provide the learning space that can add value and not work in business and usual ways? Knowing that we've been here, we've been doing all these things, what are we changing? Why should we be here as DNC days? So maybe we need that reflection in the wider conversation of business and usual, ambition, financing. So 
I wish you a very good two days of uh, interaction across the different themes. Do go on, tweet, share messages. Let's learn together. Thank you very much and thank you for joining us. Have a good day. Thank you all. A fantastic DNC day, sir. And uh, let's go and join these sessions, populate our programs and uh, make the most of it. We'll hope at some point we'll meet again in person. This two days will be virtually. Let's uh, really uh, prove that we can do this in a very low carbon kind of way. Thank you all and have a good uh, and successful two days. Bye-bye.